Hi class, last time we saw how we could use the method of Frobenius to solve a second order linear differential equation of this form where p and q were functions of x that were in fact potentially somewhat singular. p of x could blow up as fast as something proportional to 1 over x and q of x uh, as fast as something as proportional to 1 over x squared as x goes to 0. We saw that we found an initial equation. We, we looked for a solution in the form x to the alpha times the power series. And plugging into the equation, we saw that in order for the equation to be solved, alpha had to solve this quadratic equation, the initial equation, which in principle had two roots. And p0 is one way of computing it is actually to think of it as the limit as x goes to 0 of x p of x. And q0 is the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared q of x. Now. The question we still haven't quite answered is, if we have these two roots, alpha 1 and alpha 2, do we automatically have Frobenius solutions of, this, of the form 1 coming from alpha 1 and 1 coming from alpha 2? And that's what we're going to see now in terms of Fuchs theorem. So Fuchs theorem uh, is the following. If x equals 0 is a regular singular point and you have initial roots alpha 1 and alpha 2, then there are actually three separate cases. The simplest case is if the roots are distinct, alpha 1 is not equal to alpha 2, and the difference between them is not an integer. Then in that case, the simplest expectation is fulfilled. Each, alpha, each of alpha 1 and alpha 2 generate a Frobenius solution with different coefficients a sub n and b sub n, and you can plug away and, and figure out what a sub n and b sub n are. Two other, solution, <clears throat> two other situations actually occur quite frequently in the, in the problems we're considering, like Bessel's equation. Um, and the first is, if alpha 1 minus alpha 2 is an integer, then if we arbitrarily choose alpha 1 to be the one that's larger, alpha 1 will always generate a Frobenius solution. And you don't know. Alpha 2 may or may not generate a, a Frobenius solution. The only way to know is to plug in and see. You'll find an inconsistency. You'll find that uh, you just regenerate the solution with alpha 1 if it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, the solution y2, though, has a very particular form. It's the solution you found y1 times log x plus a Frobenius-like solution uh, with, uh, uh, for alpha 2. Um, one way to think of this is log x is, is sort of like x to the 0 power. So what you've done is you've taken y1 of x and you multiplied by something that really hasn't changed the power of x, and you've then added to it a solution that is of the form, uh, Frobenius form with alpha 2. That's only the second possibility. The third possibility is that you have a double root, that alpha 1 and alpha 2 are the same. In that case, uh, alpha, uh, alpha 1 and alpha 2 are the same uh, n uh, number, alpha. Then there is one Frobenius solution. And the second solution is of this alternate form, y1 times log x plus um, a sum involving uh, a, a similar sum involving um, x to the n plus alpha, but with different coefficients. So Fuchs theorem tells us what kinds of solutions we expect based on the properties of the solution of the initial equation. And in class and on the homework, you'll have, um, and possibly on the exams, you'll have some uh, practice in applying this knowledge. Thanks.